The daring rescue of Benito Mussolini by Otto Scorzani and his men in September 1943 is one of the most unbelievable events of the war, yet it is hardly talked about. When it is, even the most biased of historians tend to admit that it was an incredibly impressive achievement. There are some, however, who tried to downplay it, but thankfully, most can see through their lies. Let's talk about what actually happened. Why did Adolf Hitler take the trouble to rescue Mussolini, and how did it come about? Thank you to my patrons for making these videos possible. If you enjoy these videos and have a few spare dollars lying around, please consider signing up. Even the $2 tier helps me towards my goal of making these videos full time. Adolf Hitler's admiration of Mussolini dates back as far as Mussolini's fame on the stage of Europe does. Hitler wanted to replicate Mussolini's lightning success and do for the German people what Mussolini had done for the Italians. The histories of Italy and Germany were not too dissimilar. Both had unified late, neither doing so until 1871, and regional differences were still common. Mussolini had unified the Italian people and had grand ambitions for them in this new United State. Hitler had similar ambitions, not only along regional lines, but also along class lines. On Hitler's desk sat a bust of Mussolini, and later, when he and his architect, Speer, were drawing up the Fuhrer's perfect Berlin, a giant statue of Mussolini was in their plans. The love was not always reciprocated, however. In 1927, before Hitler had come to power, he requested a signed photograph of the Duce through an Italian diplomat in Berlin. He was refused. When Hitler did come to power, Mussolini sensed before anyone else did that a war could easily break out. Mussolini felt the same way as Hitler in regards to the post-war treaties, Italy had not gotten what she was promised by England, and Germany had been punished far too harshly. Hitler, however, had the will to take physical steps to right these supposed wrongs. Mussolini proposed a four-power pact to preempt this war, where England, France, Italy, and Germany could meet as equals to right the wrongs of the peace treaties without bloodshed. He was rejected. One of the key figures to make sure this didn't come to pass was Winston Churchill. Leading up to, and after taking power, Hitler pursued an alliance with Italy, going to lengths that many in Germany were staunchly against to do so. In the interests of an alliance with Italy, Hitler was willing to write off South Tyrol, the ethnically German lands handed over after the First World War, even though it was being subjected to an Italianization process by Mussolini. In June 1934, Mussolini reluctantly agreed to meet Hitler in Venice. It was a total failure, and left Mussolini with an even bigger distaste for the Fuhrer. According to Mussolini, Hitler made remarks about the superiority of the Nordic race and claimed that the Mediterranean peoples were infected by African blood. British diplomat Ivone Kirkpatrick describes the meeting like this. Hitler was shy and awkward on his first appearance in a foreign country, and the disparity between the two leaders was emphasized by the difference in their appearance. The Duce in his fascist uniform, resplendent among his obedient and acclaiming crowds, and the Fuhrer, ill at ease in a badly fitting suit, patent leather shoes, a shabby yellow Macintosh, and an old grey felt hat. To the eyes of the Venetians, he might have borrowed his wardrobe from Charlie Chaplin. After the meeting, Mussolini expressed similar remarks and constantly talked badly of Hitler to those around him. A few weeks later, the Night of the Long Knives took place, which Mussolini found absolutely repugnant, and the following month, the Austrian Chancellor, Engelbert Dollfuss, was murdered by Austrian Nazis. Austria was his buffer state, and Dollfuss a good friend. Dollfuss's family was visiting at the time, and Mussolini, who was hosting them, had to break the news of the murder himself. Understandably, he assumed Hitler was involved. He was furious, and ordered four divisions to head straight for the Brenner Pass. Hitler was not the culprit, however, and was equally as furious in Berlin. We are faced with a new Sarajevo, he shouted, and went into hysterics about the ridiculous behaviour of the Austrian Nazis. Ultimately, though, the whole story is for another video, and as we know, the two became allies, although not natural ones. Mussolini's opinion of Hitler changed through pure respect over time as he watched Hitler navigate the minefield of Europe and stand up to the allies, who had treated the Duce himself with such little respect. The roles reversed, and Mussolini was the one trying to be like Hitler. John Folain, in his book Mussolini's Island, describes the state of affairs in 1943. Hitler's abrupt summons on 18th of July to an urgent summit conference profoundly irritated Mussolini. Mussolini complained how he was sick of being summoned by the sound of a bell. That's how waiters are summoned. Mussolini, whom Hitler had initially admired as a model, and praised for his superior intellect, hated to be reminded just how much his fellow dictator had outshone him. In one attempt to emulate Hitler, the Duce had copied the German goose step, which he considered the greatest spectacle in the world. During one military parade, he rushed from his podium to the head of a column and goose stepped along to the amazement of onlookers. But the new marching step led to a propaganda disaster, as his soldiers, lacking the long legs of the much taller Germans, produced what one Italian marshal described as a ridiculous show of mechanical dwarves. As the war progressed, he and his country would essentially become vassals of Hitler's Germany, even before he was rescued. Hitler's respect for Mussolini never really went away though, no matter how many errors of judgement he made. Even after the Italians needed bailing out of North Africa, and invaded Greece on thin pretexts, delaying Barbarossa, Hitler could never give up on the Duce, who meant the world to him. <laughs> With
With the North African campaign brought to a close, it was time for Italy. On the 10th of July, 1943, Allied troops began landing in Sicily. Resistance was mixed, but overall, the German units stationed there were horrified by the amount of Italians giving up without a fight. The local civilian population was similar. They showed very little determination, and a large amount were quite happy to be given over into the hands of the invaders. If Mussolini's message was received well in mainland Italy, it certainly wasn't in Sicily. After only a week, the collapse was so rapid that Hitler cancelled a major offensive on the Eastern Front and diverted troops to Italy. For the third time, Hitler would attempt to bail out his ally. As a result, one-fifth of the German army was to remain in Italy until the conclusion of the war, when they could have been elsewhere. For months, even before the Allies had turned up on the beaches, the mood in Italy had been conspiratorial. Everyone seemed to want to get in on the plotting. The strangest part was, Mussolini knew, but did nothing about it. He would say the same phrase over and over to those women closest to him. My star has gone out. He felt as if his fate had run its course, and he was now resigned to events. To make matters worse, just like Hitler, he was growing incredibly ill. He had a stomach pain that was troubling him endlessly, and eating away at his will to fight on. Someone who had seen him over the previous year, so he looked like a dying man at times. The amount of stress that rests upon the shoulders of war leaders, but especially dictators, cannot even be imagined by those of us not in their situation. It is no coincidence that when both Mussolini and Hitler died within weeks of each other in 1945, both were approaching death regardless from their deteriorating bodies. The king, who Mussolini had failed to take full power from during the 20 years of fascism, was in on the action. He would leave those who came to sound him out about potential plots about Mussolini, confused as to whether he was actually in or not, but ultimately, no move could happen without him, and take part, he did. A vote of no confidence was called, and the Grand Council of Fascism approved the motion. Even Mussolini's son-in-law voted to strip Mussolini of his power. The situation was so uneasy that many in the room had hand grenades on them, in case the worst came to worst, so they could blow themselves up, and presumably, the Duce, if Mussolini sent in his black shirts after them. During the session, Mussolini threatened violence against them several times, so perhaps this wasn't the worst idea. Ultimately, though, these were empty threats, and he accepted the vote. Around an hour after he left, Mussolini called up his mistress and stated, We have reached the epilogue, the biggest turning point in history. He was still resigned to events. The next day, Mussolini had a meeting scheduled with the king. He visited some of the local bombed working-class neighbourhoods, where the locals greeted him with enthusiastic applause, despite some of their houses being in ruins. Then, ignoring his wife's desperate pleas not to go visit the king, as she felt something was wrong, he went. The king seemed strange to Mussolini as soon as he saw him. After an awkward 20-minute conversation, where the king kept avoiding eye contact and seemed to be as pale as a ghost, the monarch stood up to escort him outside, after informing him that he would be replaced by Marshal Badoglio. Once outside, a guard came up to Mussolini and asked him to get in his vehicle to protect him. Despite his pleas that it wasn't necessary, he had no choice but to go, and in reality, he was under arrest, and plans were being made to hand him over to the Allies. After being moved around and his fate seeming uncertain, he ended up in a hotel near the peak of the Gran Sasso Mountain, one of the highest points in the Apennines mountain range. Adolf Hitler was in a perilous situation in September 1943. The war was clearly turning against Germany. For whatever reason, supposedly, Hitler had refused a recent peace feeler from Stalin, who only sought a guarantee of peace and economic aid. Stalin greatly distrusted the Allies, and he was a practical leader. He didn't care for war for the sake of war, and wanted the whole thing done with. Peace with the Allies was never an option for Hitler, as Churchill was an adventurer, who could never be negotiated with, and even seemed to enjoy war. Why he refused this, we shall never know, but at the same time, issues were arising in the South. On the 8th of September 1943, Marshal Badoglio, the new leader of Italy, did exactly what Hitler expected him to do. He signed an armistice with the Allies, just after they landed in Italy proper. Hitler made a 20-page speech over the radio to frankly explain the war situation to the German people. He spoke of the destiny of the German people being bound up with his, and how he would resist till the end together, no matter what. No peace would be made in East or West, but they would persevere regardless. Hitler wasn't satisfied with giving the people all talk, though. He wanted to give them action, too, and show how serious he was. He came up with a plan so bold that it certainly would do the trick. He would rescue Benito Mussolini. After trying to track down his dear friend, he had finally been located on the mountain. Attempting to scale the mountain would be a bloodbath, and would not be quick enough to act with any surprise. The guards could simply kill Mussolini before they got there. Parachutes would be much the same, so it was decided to use gliders. Hitler chose a fellow Austrian to do the deed, Otto Scorzani. The plan was daring. Just over 100 men in 12 gliders and a recon plane were to land right next to the Duce and get him out of there in the chaos. On the 12th of September, a depressed Mussolini was sitting next to an open window with his arms folded, when suddenly a glider, using a parachute for a break, crashed into the ground with a loud bang less than 100 yards away. Men began exiting the glider and assembled a machine gun. Mussolini was in total confusion, and all he knew was that this certainly wasn't the English, 
An alarm went off, and the guards and police rose to see what the fuss was. Another glider landed 20 yards from the hotel window. Out stepped Scorzani, and he looked up to the Duce and shouted, away from the window, and rushed towards the lobby. The six foot four Scorzani barged through the hotel doors and literally bowled over the Italian to try to stop him onto the floor as he rushed straight through them and up the staircase three steps at a time. He arrived at Mussolini's door and swung it open to find the Duce stood in the middle of the room. Duce, the Fuhrer has sent me. You are free, he said. Mussolini hugged him and you can literally see from the footage the endless smile that constantly comes to his face. I knew my friend Adolf Hitler would not abandon me, he said, and continued to thank Scorzani endlessly. Scorzani said later that he was shocked by the Duce's appearance. He looked sickly and unkempt. They raced out of the hotel, and Mussolini helped clear some rocks from the runway before diving into the recon plane. It was extremely overcrowded and heavy, especially with the huge Scorzani insisting on being inside, but they tried a risky takeoff from the sketchy terrain regardless. The plane bumped erratically, and then disappeared over the cliff into the abyss. Scorzani held his breath and closed his eyes, but somehow, the pilot pulled off, and the plane recovered from its dive to the shouts and cheers of the Germans watching them. No one spoke during the flight, and the plane headed off to Rome, which was now under German control. No Germans were killed, however 10 were injured when their glider crashed and they were evacuated by cable car. Two Italians were killed by one of the squads, trying to capture the cable car nearby when one attempted to warn the garrison, and the other when he attempted to open fire on the Germans. The reason for the incredibly low casualties is the same reason why the Italians themselves were so inefficient at times during the war. They were incredibly divided. When the Germans came, many were openly sympathetic to Mussolini and simply let them go about their rescue. Others may have acted out of fear that one of their own may put a bullet in their head. There was no clear orders on what to do with Mussolini in such a situation, due to Badoglio's constant oversights, and the entire thing was a huge mess on the Italian side. Within an hour, Scorzani and his men had landed in Rome with the Duce. They drove him to the Hotel Imperial. At midnight, Scorzani's phone rang. It was the Fuhrer. The Fuhrer had been at the wolf's lair, pacing around like a caged lion, waiting for the outcome of the raid. When he got the word that it was a success, he jumped around and went into an excited frenzy, much like he had when France fell in 1940. You have performed a military feat which will become a part of history. You have given me back my friend, Mussolini, he said over the phone. He was right. I am here making this video right now, so history had clearly been made. Mussolini was to be taken to Hitler. After a brief stop in Munich, where Mussolini was reunited with his family, whom had been rescued in a separate raid at the same time as him from a castle near his hometown, they set off for East Prussia to see Hitler. They warmly embraced and stood hand in hand on the airstrip for some time before Hitler went to personally thank Scorzani. The way the rescue had come off was a massive propaganda victory for the Germans. Scorzani became a hero to the German people overnight. Hitler's disappointment was almost immediate, however. He expected the Mussolini of his imagination to return to Italy and whip things back into shape with an iron fist and an act vengeance upon those who had betrayed him. Instead, the Mussolini of 1943 only wanted to retire with his family to the Romagna countryside. Hitler rallied against the king and tried to restore Mussolini's spirit and explained how the war would be won and Italy restored so that Mussolini could reign once more. But the Duce was having none of it. He was a broken man. Ultimately, he had no choice though, and he became the leader of the Italian Social Republic, which controlled the north of Italy. He was an all but name, Hitler's puppet, not for a lack of respect on Hitler's part, but because the situation would deteriorate if this was not the case, and Germany would have an even bigger problem in the south. Hitler did say to his family circle, however, I admit that I was deceived. It has turned out that Mussolini is only a little man. The powerful Duce that was in Hitler's mind either never existed or was a thing of the past. The reality in front of him showed that Mussolini was simply no longer fit to run a reliable independent state at the present time. Despite many post-war attempts to underplay the impressiveness of this raid, most still happily admit what a feat it was. A hundred men appear from the sky, inflicted only two casualties, and then disappear with their target in one piece. If Winston Churchill was somehow captured, and Roosevelt were to send in a squad of commandos to go and rescue him in this fashion, it would be one of the most talked about events in history, and several blockbuster films would have been made of the event. The lack of casualties is part of the impressiveness of the event. It all happened so fast that the Italians simply did not know how to react. Regardless of which side one supports from the war, you must give credit to the events of Gran Sasso. Thank you for watching, and yes, I will do a full video on Scorsini himself one day, and also most likely a series on Mussolini, like I've done with Hitler, but shorter. Lastly, a huge thank you to my patrons. Lobster to you, Darway Lololol, Sigmar, Emperor Titus, Luke David Murphy, Chechen Natsog, Anton Berglund, Levi E, Lanza, Friendly Brian, Mr Malabar, Bushak, and Firefly Enterprise. If you'd like to join our Patreon Discord, or our weekly Hearts of Iron 4 games, please consider becoming a patron for as little as $2 a month in the link in the description to help me towards my goal of making these videos full-time. Thank you.